Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST team. My name is Matt Graybaugh. I'm a science coordinator with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Science Applications Program, and I'm based in Tucson, Arizona. I'm also one of the co-directors of CCAST. CCAST launched a webinar series in April of this year, April of 2020. Our webinars to date have focused primarily on control of non-native aquatic species, in support of the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. We're going to continue having monthly webinars on non-native aquatic species control efforts, but we'll also begin featuring additional aquatic species conservation and management case study presentations like we're doing today. And with that, I will hand it over to Alex. Thank you, Matt. My name is Alex Caberly, and I'm a research specialist at the University of Arizona where I work on CCAST. Um, today, I'm really excited to share um, this presentation that we have from Lily Allen and John Hannon on native Chinook salmon and steelhead conservation and habitat restoration in the Lower American River in uh, California. John Hannon is a fisheries biologist with the Bureau of Reclamation, and Lily Allen is a program manager and scientist for the Water Forum based out of Sacramento, California. If you have any questions for Lily and John throughout the presentation, um, as Matt mentioned, please enter them in the chat box and we will read those uh, at the end of today's presentations. So now I'd like to turn it over for John for his presentation. Okay, thanks a lot, Alex and Matt. And so I'm gonna start out with kind of a, a Central Valley of California wide view, um, talk a little bit about salmon and then zoom into the American River. Um, where Lily will focus on specific, uh, a specific project in the American River with a lot of details on that. So the cover slide here, that's an aerial view of, of, a, of a habitat improvement project under, under construction in the American River. And then we'll get started. So our target species that we're focusing on, Pacific salmon, five species of Pacific salmon, um, Chinook salmon is the only one we have in the Central Valley of California down here. Um, also chum, sockeye, pink, and coho along the coast. Their range is all the way up through Alaska. Um, so the American River, we have Chinook salmon and we have steelhead trout uh, down here. Um, the Chinook salmon has mostly a three-year life cycle um, in California. Um, can be up to a five-year life cycle. Uh, but the adults, um, well, they spawn in fresh water. Um, then the juveniles head out to the ocean. They do their rearing in the ocean out in here and put on a lot of growth. Uh, Chinook salmon are the largest of the salmon species. They're 10 to 20 pound, uh, pounds on average. Um, and they die, they, so they come, out, come back to spawn and then they die after they spawn. Steelhead have a similar similar type of life cycle. Um, the only difference, well, there's a few differences, but the big one is that they, they do not die after they spawn. Steelhead are a, an anadromous rainbow trout. So folks are, if you're not familiar with Chinook salmon or steelhead, you're probably familiar with rainbow trout. So on the left-hand side, this is kind of the status of Chinook salmon. Green is, is where they're doing better. Um, red and, and orange, they're not doing as well. So in California, we're in the, in the red and orange range here. Uh, the reds are mostly where they don't exist anymore um, above, above dams. Uh, the fish are still here. They're just below the dams. Um, they're not really extinct. They're just not in those areas. Um, and then on the right hand side is precipitation. Uh, salmon are a cold water species. They need cold water and a lot of water. Um, Central Valley of California is fairly dry here. Uh, not really enough water for salmon. Most of our water comes from the mountains. Um, the Central Valley is, is rimmed by mountains. Um, uh, so we get uh, like 15 to 20 inches of rain a year and then up to 100 in the mountains. The, the more uh, purple colors are um, or more rain. This is a precipitation map, if I didn't mention that. Purple is more rain and, and, and the, the reddish colors are less. Um, so salmon do better where there's more water and colder water, which we're at the southern end of that. 
So the timing of the species here in California, we have four different Chinook salmon runs. Um, we're the only place in the world that, that is, has four, four runs um, based on timing when they come back from the ocean. So the run that we have in the, in the American River, which is a tributary to the Sacramento River, is the fall run up here. Um, so these are the months of the year. Right now, the adults are coming upstream to spawn. The spawning peaks um, in November in the American River. Uh, the eggs are in the gravel, so they spawn in gravel. Um, the eggs incubate in the gravel for about three months. The peak um, emergence of the, the baby, the juveniles from the gravel or the fry is about mid-February. And then they're in, in the river from anywhere from a few days. Some head downstream right after they come out of the gravel. Um, others stay longer up until, up until about summer. If they stay past that, um, in the American River, it gets a little warm for them. Some rivers, they'll, they'll stay year round at the fall run, mostly head out and spend just a couple, couple months in fresh water. Um, and then the steelhead is our other species in the American River. So similar type of life cycle, except they, they spawn a little bit later in the winter time, um, spawning and incubation in the winter time. Uh, they spend a full year in the, uh, in the river um, and then head out in the American River, pretty much they just stay one year. They head out the next spring um, at about 10 to 12 inches, head to the ocean um, and then come back as adults a couple, just spend two years out um, the American River fish and then come back as adults. So a map of the area. So this is looking from the Pacific Ocean um, towards the east, towards the Central Valley of California. Uh, this is pretty much salmon spend most of their time out in here. This is where they put on all their growth. Probably 90, 98 percent of, of their growth happens out here and then they reproduce. So they, they eat, eat, eat and then come back to the rivers to reproduce. So um, all the, the water from the Central Valley comes out through San Francisco at the Golden Gate Bridge. And then here, zooming into the American River, which is kind of in the middle of the Central Valley. Uh, the confluence of the Sacramento River at the bottom here. We have 23 miles up to, the, to, to our dam, which is Nimbus Dam, um, which is the top of their habitat. So we, our projects are focused in that reach. So the Central Valley Project Improvement Act is a law that was enacted in about, I think about 1992. Um, so it, it put fish and wildlife purposes um, kind of on equal footing with uh, water supply and power production um, in the federal Central Valley Project. And it set up a restoration fund, which the water users and the, the power Power producers pay into that fund, um, and that's how we, how our projects get paid for um, through that fund. Uh, so it covers the whole Central Valley. Um, so we have a CVPIA structured decision-making team that we set up a few years ago. It has a website here. If anyone wants to check it out, um, you can go to that website. Uh, but this team of, of a bunch of experts in, in salmon and, and biology and, and engineering who, who go through a structured decision-making process to, to determine what types of actions can best meet the goals of the, of the, the law. Um, kind of a key goal that we focus on is an anatomous fish doubling goal. Um, so trying to double the population of anatomous fish. And we have decision support models for each species um, to identify which watersheds we should work in and what types of projects we should do in those watersheds to, to be most effective. Um, and we have roughly monthly meetings. So they're open to anyone um, and shown on the website. Here, this is our list of current priority restoration actions for Chinook salmon. Um, in that uh, uh, this structure, structured decision-making process. So for the American River, juvenile habitat restoration is a priority and also maintaining existing spawning habitats in the American River. So those are the current focus of our habitat efforts in the American River. We also have information priorities. Um, these are things that could 
could improve the model and improve our our decisions on what types of actions to take um, to meet the goals of the, the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. So those things are all, all our goals um, under CVPIA are pretty much based on, on salmon in our case, though identifying limiting factors for juveniles, for adult spawning, for egg incubation, um, trying to provide fish, the whole reason for that the law was enacted, people like to catch salmon, like to eat salmon. Um, so our, our goals are largely based on salmon. Uh, but being in California where we've got, uh, I don't know how many people now, 30 million plus, I think, um, our, our little fish team is, is a small part of a big picture. So we try to try to work in harmony with, with all these other uses. We've set up a lot of partnerships with uh, with water users, with power producers, um, recreationists, uh, we try to try to try to do our best to to do our habitat projects, um, meeting our goals, and and allow other folks to continue to meet their goals, and and kind of all work together um, in partnerships. So this is the the Federal Central Valley project, the, kind of the water project in California that the federal and state government set up back in the early early 1900s. Um, Folsom Dam and American River is the part we're talking about today in the middle. So our the types of things we do, we're trying to increase habitat producti productivity in the Central Valley Rivers, uh, specifically for, for salmon. Um, the focus and the American River is what we're talking about today. So the things we do, we add gravel to maintain habitats, um, spawning and rearing habitats, um, the dams to cut off cut off our sediment supply. Um, so we, we enhance and create juvenile rearing habitats. We open up uh, historic side channels that build new side channels um, for juvenile rearing habitats and the gravel helps, helps the juvenile habitats as well. We have continuous monitoring for each project to look at, at how well it does at meeting, meeting the goals of the project and needs of the species. Um, and so we can improve on future projects and we do a lot of stakeholder collaboration in, uh, in working through the projects. So in the American River, um, one of the big habitat issues that we're working on addressing um, is I guess the kind of the, the simplification of the habitat. So these are a couple aerial photos. Uh, this is a historic one, um, well, early 1900s and then current conditions here. This is the lower end of the American River where it flows into the Sacramento River. Um, you can see it, it uh, there's, you know, kind of a complex channel, pools and riffles, gravel bars. Um, and today it's just a straight shot through there. Um, you can drive a, drive a boat up through there with a deep prop and no, no worries about hitting anything um, a lot. It's just a big pool there, much, much simpler habitat. Um, and this is a, a graphic down here um, showing that. So the, the dark line is the bottom, the elevation of the bottom of the river from the Sacramento River up to Nimbus Dam, um, what it is today. And then the dotted line is what it used to be. You can see in the bottom end of the river here, which I'm showing, it's, it's about 10 feet lower than what it, what it used to be. And that's, that's our new baseline that we have to uh, work within um, for like uh, flood constraints. But, but so that, that down cutting has cut off a lot of our side channels and flood plains. So we're trying to uh, uh, recreate some of those types of habitat. Um, some of the things we're not, not really able to address, the flows have changed, um, the change in flows. This is the one day so red, red are the current flows, green are the historic flows. Um, so the, the low flows have, uh, are not as low as they used to be um, because we have the dam, Folsom Dam. Uh, but the high flows, we still have good high flows. Folsom Dam is not, not huge. It's uh, not that large relative to the size of the watershed. Um, so we're, it doesn't fully control the flow. We still get some really high flows that, that do a good job of moving gravels around. Um, but the, the 
blockage of the supply uh, has been an issue. The biggest issue on flows probably for the fish is that the hydrograph has kind of been flattened. Um, so historically we had a peak in the springtime, which was when juvenile fish were out and they did really well. Don't have that peak anymore. So it's hard to design like floodplain type projects because um, we don't, don't have the flood, uh, the hydrograph we did. It's flows are high in the summertime. So designing uh, vegetated areas that will flood or is, we're not able to do that anymore. Water temperature, we're water temperature challenged in the American River. If you know about salmon and what temperatures they like, it's, uh, it's down in here in the, mostly in the 50s. Uh, this is this year, water temperatures. You see we're in the above 65. This is at Nimbus Dam. Um, we have a temperature control device on the dam, so we all get together and do the best we can to dole out that, that cold water. Uh, but it's, we run out, you know, we try to run out exactly when it starts to cool off, um, but we're not able to provide the ideal temperature. So that's a limiting factor in the river. So here I'm going to, this is one of our habitat projects. This is a pre-project photo. I'm going to do a little time lapse, uh, run through a little time lapse. The, our habitat project is right in here. You can see it's kind of a straight shot a big old gravel bar that's like a desert out there most of the time. Um, not much in the way of habitat. So I'll run through this. What we did is we, we excavated the side channel here in the floodplain, uh, built the side channel, uh, processed all the gravel, and put it, in, put it back into the river to create spawning habitat. Those are created side channel, floodplain, and spawning habitat. That was one we did in 2016. Uh, here's pictures of it uh, kind of on the ground. This is a before picture. You can see a fairly narrow shot of water coming down through there. This is an after shot here where we widened the channel, um, cut down. This is all floodplain that we created. Uh, we added, added wood added boulders. Uh, most of our excavated material, uh, a lot of it anyway, um, we sorted it and put it into the river. You can see how much wider the channel became. That all became spawning habitat. A um, couple construction photos on the right hand side here. So that was 2016. Um, 2017, uh, this project is, it was unique and that we got our, the highest flows we've had in many years. Uh, just a few months after we finished the project. Um, so here's our high flow that we got. This is, uh, this is the same, basically the same view that I showed in that last slide, looking upstream over the project. So here's our completed project. And then uh, water kind of flowed across it like that. Um, you can see our spawning riffle is stayed, uh, but our side channel or our floodplain got largely covered by gravel. Uh, so that was, uh, that's the first time we've had that. We've done multiple projects. That's the first one that we've had uh, that quick of a, of a change after we did the project. Uh, the spawning habitat's still, still doing good though. Um, we had about 150 Chinook salmon spawned out there last year, uh, but the rearing habitat uh, didn't, didn't, didn't fare quite as well. So um, this is my last slide. Uh, some of the challenges that we have um, in projects on the American River. And at, at, this is kind of Central Valley wide challenges, I guess. So flood concerns limit the scope. Um, everything we do, we have to keep flooding in mind um, or we can't uh, increase water surface elevations more than a tenth of a foot with our projects. So that limits how much we can, how much material we can move around. Um, landowner agreements. So on the American River, we have an awesome landowner. It's the uh, city of Sac or County of uh, Sacramento, um, who has been who is really supportive. Uh, but some of the other rivers, especially the Sacramento, each each project seems to have about three landowners. It's it's really challenging to work through all those agreements for each project. Uh, we try to utilize our excavated material on site. So, like you saw, we excavate to open up side channels or create new side channels. Um, we don't want to wind up being being monit being uh, kind of monit or 
mining, um, mining a river that's always already short, uh, already down cut. So we tried to utilize everything we excavate as much as we can in, in our projects uh, within, the, within those flood concerns. Um, each project's got a bunch of permits. Um, each one's unique. It's not like a cookie cutter thing. We have new, new things come up on each project and, and it's like starting almost from scratch on each one. Uh, wetlands conversions, that's not really an issue on the American River, so I'm not going to talk about that one. Designing around people, we've done, we've tried to do that, um, make it so people and fish won't, uh, you know, people won't poach fish or won't be able to get to the projects. That's been limited, limited amount of success, so we've, we've gone to more just focusing on creating the habitat and, and letting the people and the fish, uh, hopefully live in harmony. Uh, bridges, we've, we've gotten into the bridge business on some other rivers, luckily not on the American River. Um, when we make a side channel, it cuts off some, some dry ground that uh, a lot of times people want to maintain access. So you have to deal with bridge issues. Uh, I already talked about the hydrograph and the water temperature, so I won't mention those again. Um, and now Lily Allen is going to talk about, she's the expert at, at meeting all these challenges. So Lily. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll try to, let me see. Um, Stop share. Let me see if I can start sharing my screen too. Hmm. Sorry, everyone. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you see how I share my screen? Oh, there it is. Gosh. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to reach out and thank Alex and Matt again for all of their help setting this up and making sure that we're saying the right things and getting some information to you folks. And thanks, John, for all of his insights and his deep work on getting the funding and the vision to us and making sure this whole thing is possible. So as Alex introduced, I'm Lily Allen. I work for the Water Forum. And we are a multi-agency quasi-board group of folks, mostly employee, public employees that focus on keeping the Lower American River wild and scenic and beautiful and providing a, wild, uh, a water supply to the region as well. So as John pointed out, this is where we're focusing right here in the Sacramento region. The black area is historic salmon habitat and the blue area is what they have left. So 23 miles, zooming in on that, out of, you know, quite a lot. And one of the other things I'd like to point out here is the temperature difference that John John talked about. It's it's nice and cool up in these mountain hills and mountain creeks. And today in Sacramento, where I am, it is like 95 degrees. So it's, the fish are really experiencing a different environment than they were they they were adapted to, being stuck on the Central Valley floor as the rest of us instead of being in that cool, crisp, clear mountain stream. I'm going to talk today about the project we completed in 2019. We had hoped to complete a project in 2020 this year, but like everything else in 2020, it didn't go so well. One of the things I hope you really notice from this slide is that this is a stream in a completely urbanized area. And there are about 1.5 million people that live in Sacramento County in this region. And that's a pretty big water supply, too, who get their water mostly from this river. There is a little bit of groundwater as well, but primarily the Lower American River water users get their water from the Lower American River. And balancing fisheries needs with two populations that we really focus on with the water supply needs and the recreational needs as well is quite a thing. The Lower American River here also has a huge recreation component. More people visit the bike trail that runs along these 23 miles than people go to Yosemite in a year. Pretty impressive. 
so moving back to our project here, um, we did this project first, I think in like 2008 and 2009, and then we came back in 2019, and I want to talk today about how we made that decision to return to a spot we've already restored, what we learned, and what we hope to continue learning through that. So we measure our success through REDS, R-E-D-D-S. They are salmon nests. As John was saying, when the fish swim upstream and then they spawn and they die, they dig holes with their tails and it's it's pretty wild because they stop eating nutrients when they enter fresh water from salt water. So they're like these zombie, 20 pound zombie fish with like flaps of scales falling off and like nearly dead and they're digging these holes next to another zombie fish and spawning and then they bury them again. And you can see these nests and reds from aerial photographs. So every year, John, thankfully, gets um, an airplane to fly really close to the river and take photos with the right lens that you can see through the water into these disturbed gravel patches and count the number of reds we have. So we have a pretty good estimate on population and how many fish have spawned. And what you're seeing here are our sites from 2008 and 2009, the yellow dots are reds on them. So you can see there are some, and quite a lot in here. And then this was a different project site. There are some over there too. Um, and the numbers also change with ocean conditions and how many fish are returning and were there, was there a really big population three years ago? There are a lot of factors, but this is definitely one of them that we use to make decisions. And then you can see in 2016, oh, quite a lot of fish kind of using our spots. This area is right near a dam and a fish weir, so it's kind of, it kind of hit the top of their, their range here. But then in uh, 2017, there were, uh, I think there are four on these two sites, and it's a 97% decrease. So as John showed earlier, there was a really big flood. It, messed, it reorganized our 2016 project and washed out the side channel or filled it in. And it also really redistributed the gravel up at this site, which had been one of our most productive sites. So with that information, we realized that the, the, the gravel that the fish used to spawn had washed downstream to, to a place that was not appropriate for the fish to spawn and they weren't utilizing it anymore. So we decided it's time to go back and remodel that area to increase production again. So what you're looking at here is a habitat suitability um, model for Chinook salmon. It's one of the other metrics we use. So salmon like to spawn in water that is about two feet deep with two feet of velocity flowing over it. And they like gravel that is about the size of your fist with some little tiny spots on top. And we can model and measure the two feet deep and the two feet of flow going over it. What you're seeing here is that the green is good, the red is bad, and there's a uh, not a lot of green, and it matched up pretty well with the few spots the fish did spawn in. We have that same type of model for steelhead, so it's a little better. Steelhead are smaller fish, as John said, and so they prefer slightly smaller rocks with slightly slower water. And we tune that in our model as well. What flow do we model all of this at? Well, down here it's 1,750 CFS, which is our typical fall flow. Since this is a regulated river with the dam, we get usually pretty consistent fall flows. Um, the hydrograph in California means it doesn't really rain from May to November. So once the water year kind of wraps up in May, you know what you're going to get. You're rarely going to get a big storm in June, although with climate change, everything is getting wonky. So with this information and knowing that the gravel size has changed as well, we were able to think like, okay, let's go back and what can we build on top of our past projects in 2008 and 2009 to improve the likelihood of success. So this was our restoration site and this is our, where we get the gravel that we put back in the river. The Lower American River is part of gold country and there was a huge part of the gold rush here and these these areas here, these bumps in the ground, this is historic dredger tailings from the mining days, uh, which is pretty bonkers. So we, we don't mine, we because we, mining is a completely different thing and our permits uh, would be a real different permitting nightmare. We definitely just rearrange and sort the right-sized gravel out 
and then we bring it along a haul road here and we place it into the main restoration area. And this year you'll notice these look really similar to the past that we did in 2008 and 2009, but this is different. We did a side channel as well. And the side channel is to address juvenile rearing because you can think of these two gravel patches as a maternity ward for fish where the babies are born and pop out. And then the side channel you can think of as a nursery where the little juvenile can go get some cover and you know, grow a little bigger before they have to run the gauntlet out to the ocean. So I'm going to show you some videos of the on the ground stuff. This is us placing gravel into the main channel. And what you're looking at here is a 40 yard dump truck. And it might be surprising to see this just driving into the channel, but it has been pressure washed and all the fluids have been changed to be biodegradable and food grade vegetable oil. So if it did spring a lake, we're not going to have the Deepwater Horizon American River edition. After that, um. keep going slides. Okay, uh, we push the gravel around and here's some more dumping it. You can see we're building a perimeter here and that's for sediment control and it does a, a decent job. We, we try and wash the gravel too as we sort it and place it in here. We build up in here the volume of gravel we're going to need to push it across the river. I'd also like to point out that there are two different sizes of gravel. This stuff here is more cobble size and this stuff here is more spawning size. One of the things we've learned through adaptive management is that the the cobble is a, is a bigger rock, right? So it takes more energy to push that rock. And you can use it as a speed bump for your smaller rock. So if flow is coming this way and we have higher flows, they kind of bump up against the bigger rocks and our projects have a longer longevity. So we're getting a better value when we do the bottom end of each spawning pad with larger cobble. It also, as John was saying, it's really helpful to have something to do with those bigger rocks. And then we're we push them across the river with a, a D9 bulldozer. It's a really big bulldozer because we get to do a lot of pushing. Uh, I also want to point out that these guys out there doing it are City of Sacramento Department of Utilities employees. They're the guys who do your drainage and levee maintenance and replace your pipes and address sewer problems. We, since we are part of the City of Sacramento, they're one of our organizational members. We can borrow their guys have them work on this project for a month where they love it because we're subsidizing their salary and we're giving them a lot of equipment experience that they wouldn't otherwise get and a lot of camaraderie too and some lunches. Uh, and we get a workforce that really cares about these projects. Since they're handpicked from all over the city, they, we get guys that just really want to help the fish and they love driving bulldozers to do it. So once the truck empties the rocks in the river, it moves over to the side channel and gets filled up again. And this is where we're taking the material from the side channel and then we drive it back over to where it gets sorted. This is an aerial view and you can see here's the side channel excavation and process and here's the first gravel placement area. And we're, we haven't connected them at all because of water quality constraints. So we're hoping to excavate, excavate, and leave it blocked off until the end. And that's about a one mile, a little over journey, one way in this dump truck over to this processing plant where we have gravel sorters, sorting it into three sizes. The right size, which we put the top for spawning, the a little bit too big cobbles, which we use at the bottom, and then sand and fines, which over here. And we use those to help bolster county maintenance roads. So this is within the Sacramento County Park system and they have a lot of fire roads and maintenance roads. And they like having a pile of really nice signs to like make their fire roads pretty nice. And we want to be a good neighbor so we clean it up extra well when we leave. And their roads are in perfect condition in case they need to do any patrolling, maintenance, or fire. So this is before you've seen this, and then I'm going to show you after. This is after. So lots more green, and then lots of, and a brand new side channel. The red dots here, you can ignore them. They're uh, uh, trees that we try and work around. You can see the side channel gets wider and narrower, and that there are some islands in there. There's a lot of complexity to address juvenile rearing needs. It's really quite cool. 
And then here's Steelhead as well. So there was before it was pretty pretty lousy and after is pretty good. We try and split the difference between Steelhead and Chinook for both species. And these are the guys that do all the hard work. And they might look kind of tough here, but they're actually every single one of them is a sweetheart who like likes to bring their kids. And it's it's a great it's a great thing for all of us to work with them. So this is before, and then this is after. And I want to really point out that here is the first spawning pad, here is the side channel, and here is the second spawning pad. And then we have an island in here to create more edge habitat for juveniles, and then another island in here. And here, this is a fish hatchery also. So it's, it's the salmon's last chance before they go into the hatchery and get mechanically spawned, which is not a fate that I personally would enjoy. So here is sort of summing it up by the numbers. We have we created about five acres of habitat. It costs about $800,000 to do that. Um, and we placed about 13, almost 14,000 cubic yards of material and we excavated about a little under 13,000 cubic yards of material. That's not an accident. That's the, the way we design it. It took us 17 days working very hard uh, with 16 pieces of equipment. We created two islands and 3,000 feet of edge habitat. We were in the news three times um, and some trade publications and we only ran over one person's cell phone who happened to be a Bureau of Reclamation employee. Sorry, John. And um, what are we doing in the future? So. These are 10 sites we have, and we, I just talked to you about Upper Sailor Bar. And we are hoping to do all 10 of them, have them permitted, which is a whole, whole complicated bear that I won't get into here, but I'd be happy to talk to people about later. So we can choose, based on science, need, and adaptive management, which site we need best every year and go and do one. This year, we had hoped to do Ansel Hoffman, but 2020, you know, it just didn't work out. But we're hoping to do it in 2021, as well as something up here at Lower Sailor Bar. So we're hoping to do two projects so we can catch up and have permits for all 10 of these projects for the next 15 years. So no one has to think about the regulatory stuff again in a new and creative way. This is our project team. Um, staying behind a bulldozer with a lovely filter. And here are our partners. Uh, SAFCA is the Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency, Reclamation, County Parks, our landowner, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And thank you again so much to Matt and Alex and everyone who helped bring this to light. And uh, that's it for me. Wanda, questions? All right. Yeah. Thank you, Lily and John. Um, both excellent presentations. And I think um, a really nice uh, level of uh, technical detail between the salmon biology component and also with this uh, active habitat restoration that's going on. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, feel free to type your questions into the chat bar. Um, make sure that it's to everyone so that we can see them. Um, if you also have a question you'd like to ask, um, you can jump in on your um, webcam too. So we have a few questions coming in. So first, um, from David, what other species uh, benefited from this project? And I'm assuming um, by species, it may be uh, other species of fish or even uh, wildlife species. Yeah, so, um, uh, so fish are our targets, of course. So the macroinvertebrates is one thing that, that we definitely affect when we get out there. Um, those things, they, you know, the macroinvertebrates uh, live on the rocks and the riffles. Um, we kind of extirpate them pretty much when in our specific spot and they move back in act with higher, higher populations than, than what we had when the project started, um, which, which is really good for fish food kind of thing. Um, uh, other species, I guess all, all everything that, that uh, eats salmonids uh, benefits, including the people. The people love the fish, so <laughs> those species, the people. Uh, we've got a lot of ospreys, um, the benefit, various wildlife uh, along the river. Um, 
I think that, um, yeah, definitely birds, and we have some wild coyotes out there that also benefit. Uh, and one of the reasons we focus on salmon is because they're an ecosystem indicator. When the salmon are doing well, we can think that the ecosystem is doing well. And also, they were here before us. You know, like, as we, as I was discussing in our history, there's been a lot of colonialism in this area. And having, making sure that we are taking care of the land and the things that were here before us is important to my organization and the region. Yeah, thanks, John and Lily. Um, so we have a few more questions coming in. Um, so this is from Lauren. Uh, has there been any field work to check whether or not salmon have used this new habitat yet? John, I know you've been out there. Yeah, so so uh, last year that the one at Sailor Bar there that Lily showed, I think we had we had over a thousand salmon spawned on it. Um, so uh, actually, I'm going to share my screen here real quick if that'll work, and we can show you what used it. Maybe, I think. I believe in you. <laughs> I thought I had it easy, but maybe not. Okay, here we go. So here's a before and after. Um, at the after, you'll see some of the utilization. Um, so there's the riffle, the two riffles and the side channel. Um, looking downstream, this is just a one, one minute video here, but you'll see some of the utilization by the fish. Um, this, this is immediately after right there. Uh, so the, the new project. So all those light colored spots, those are where salmon spawned. You can see the, the dark things there, those are salmon. All these light colored spots are, are where salmon are, are making nests. Here's the juveniles in the side channel um, last year. So we had a lot of little babies in the side channel. So that was, that was awesome to see them. And so, yeah, that's what we got. We had over a thousand salmon spawned in it. Um, last year. Yeah, thanks Pretty for sharing. <laughs> okay, so we have a few questions on um, habitat use and flows. So um, a question here, is the substrate placed in the J-hook type placement? And did the modified habitat alter, also alter the productivity of the system, uh, i.e. reducing fish or macro invert biomass? I don't know about the J hook type placement. I'm not sure what that means. John, do you know? Or yes, the, yeah, that they, was a question for me too. It did, the macroinvertebrate, it did affect them. They, but they, it's amazing how quickly they recolonize. Um, actually, when we did our first project, we did a lot of macroinvertebrate monitoring and uh, populations are actually higher after the projects than they are before. Um, in just like a couple months, things are, uh, recolonized. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure about the J hook. <laughs> Maybe we didn't use it because we don't know what it is. But. <laughs> <laughs> we do use um, front end loaders, bulldozers, and excavators, if, if that helps answer that question. And um, that we also did some studies on the gravel size and how that impacts macroinvertebrates and conjoined with egg tubes and survival. So we one year we built, and I love this, a patchwork quilt of different gravel sizes across at different depths and velocities uh, on our spawning pad. And we learned that fish love to spawn on the smaller rocks, but macroinvertebrates and airflow, hyper airflow, don't get in there as much, so their babies and survival are a little lower. I would guess that that's because the fish are um, not they're pretty tired once they have to swim up here and stop eating and they do want to move smaller rocks which makes sense to me but it's not what we use because it's the, the survival is lower and we're really looking to increase the fish okay and uh feel free to jump in again in the chat or even the video for the um question regarding the j-hook placement if um we need further clarification um so now uh, i wanted to ask a question here um about flows. So have you determined what flows will maintain what you have created? 
how you might need to adapt projects to maintain spawning and rearing habitat at a beneficial ratio? Well, we, since the, the river is so regulated by the dam, there are regulatory minimums for flows in most years. Sometimes there are absolutely critical years and that's when we all have to get together and make the best of it. But in normal conditions and below normal conditions, there the flows are 800 C have a have a floor of about 800 CFS. So we designed for that because the, the side channel and the spawning grounds are functioning at 800 CFS. They're ideal at 1750, but you know we understand that there's a range, and each water year is different. And we, we don't try to to design so things don't don't move at all. Um, we realize that you know we get high flows uh, and it renews a lot of the habitat, even though it may affect a specific spot we worked. Um, the whole whole river benefits when we get the high flows and move things around. We're actually lucky here that we, um, habitat-wise, that we still get a lot of high flows compared to a lot of other rivers that don't. Okay, so we did have a, a follow-up comment here. So according to the uh, Rosegen, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, um, geomorphic channel design. There are the J-hook vein, uh, W weir, and cross vein structures, and this is the type of substrate or barrier placement in the river channel. Okay, yeah, I went to one of his courses once. Um, he's a cool guy, uh, kind of cowboy guy. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember the J-hook, so <laughs> I'll have to say um, we haven't specifically uh, designed with Rosgen's, um, Rosgen's methods in mind, I guess. Um, from what I remember, it was kind of a, we're in a really big river here, so it's hard to, hard to do major, major geomorphic, uh, geomorphic changes, kind of the, the stuff that Ro I learned from Rosgen was kind of more small river focused. We have about a 300 foot wide channel that, uh, uh, I would say, yeah, we probably have not used the J-hook design. Um, we have put boulders in, which Rosgen uh, talks a lot about. Um, uh, not not like our river's too big for, for our boulders to really affect geomorphology kind of thing. So we haven't probably fully implemented the ty types of things he talks about. Okay, so uh, feel free to continue uh, submitting questions. We have about 10 more minutes, um, but we have another question switching gears to uh, invasive species. So are there any aquatic uh, invasive species in your work area? And if so, um, how can the salmon habitat be affected by them? Yeah, I would say that we have red suspania is a really big problem in our area. It's an aquatic invasive plant and it chokes out and decreases the dissolved oxygen in the water, which is no good for anyone except for that plant. Uh, one of the ways we address it is we work with county parks and some of our local foundation partners to have volunteers or others go out and pull it every year. It's just something we have to put money into and hope for the best. We got a lot of bass too, which aren't aren't native. So they they like to they like to eat and they like to eat salmon when the salmon are close by. So, um, but our projects, uh, you know, we have kind of stranding areas that are a lot of times full of bass, isolated ponds. We sometimes we open those up, so that makes them not not bass habitat. We we try to convert bass habitat, which is mostly non-native species habitat. Um, into more cold water species habitat, more native species assemblage kind of thing. Okay, so um, so a couple uh, uh, follow-ups at a, just a broader level here. So we had a question on if you could uh, uh, go into a little more detail on the funding mechanism mechanisms for this huge effort. And then um, a parallel to that too, I was kind of wondering, um, you know, you've mentioned you work across multiple land ownership types, like for folks, um, I noticed there's people joining from Oregon, we have some people here from California and also in the Southwest, you know, working in systems with uh, different land ownership, you know, what are some strategies, um, whether it's funding or engaging um, different landowners to be able to implement your project? 
So yeah, the landowner part on the American River um, has been awesome working with our landowner. We just, it's pretty much one landowner, uh, but on like, especially the Sacramento River, um, which has a lot of private land, a lot of landowners. Um, we try to try to do, try to meet the landowner's needs as, as much as we can. We'll integrate things in the projects that may not be totally fish fish centric like sometimes they want a boat ramp so they can drive down to the river um probably half of them want paid so we have to work out how we can how we can pay them to work on their property because we're, we're modifying their property so it, it um we can justify uh paying for for that type of thing we've uh we worked with the city of Reading to to fund a bridge across one of our side channels, or two bridges across one of our side channels. Um, that allowed the project to go forward. It wouldn't have um, otherwise. We actually had three different sites up there that uh, we had to deal with bridges to um, satisfy the landowners. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll have kind of grumpy landowners when we start. Um, I don't think we've ever had a grumpy landowner when we finish. They're always, they've always been happy with things uh, the way it turned out. Once we, once we get their cooperation, it's, it usually goes, goes really well that I guess the hard part is the initial, uh, initial comfort level, working on the comfort level and just going to meet them on their property kind of thing, do a lot of that. Um, and I think I might have missed the first part of your question, but. Sure, yeah, if you could speak a little more on just the uh, funding mechanisms oh, for a project of this scale. Yeah, so in the American River, uh, Lily, what do we spend? About a million dollars a year on average, I think. Um, so we have, yeah. okay. That restoration fund I mentioned covers the whole Central Valley and it's it's around $50 million every year for for the Central Valley, um, about half of that, or I think more than half of that goes to purchase water uh, from water rights holders to flood uh, wildlife refuges. Um, I think for fish projects, for actually on the ground implementation of, of things, it's in the like 10 to, uh, well it varies by year, 10 to $20 million per year for fish, uh, habitat projects and monitoring projects, that type of thing. And it all comes from, from the water users, the farmers um, uh, that pay for the water and the power users. Uh, well, no, take that back. It's not all from them. Some of it comes from federal appropriations. Um, a large proportion comes from, uh, from the water users. So the people that benefit from the water um, put back, put things back into the habitat. And, uh, that's, that's and um, go ahead. from our end, we get our funding from all the local water purveyors, and we contribute a lot of in-kind and little things. So, like, my time is not billed to the project. It's one of the things we contribute in-kind. And we also, we see ourselves as a gas filler. So, sometimes things will come up, and we'll just need to spend $1,000 or $15,000 here and there to make sure the project gets done. And since we have a lot more flexibility in our funding, the city of Sacramento is our fiduciary agency. And so we can do contracts and go to bid for things pretty quickly. I would also be remiss in not thinking the Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency, who is a partner in this project for providing funding for permitting and getting us our long-term permits, which has been expensive and no one likes paying for permits and no one really likes doing the permits. So we're very thankful they hired a consultant uh, and just let us let them help us. Those are certainly some really important details uh, and will be really useful for people listening today. So we do have a couple more minutes. Um, feel free to jump in with any last minute questions. Um, give everyone another minute or so. Um, I would be also remiss in not saying, and I should have had some slides, but it didn't work out that way, that my office, the Water Forum, will be having a symposium on October 14th from 1 to 4 p.m. where we're looking at uh, water supply needs 
in our region and flood control needs and with a focus on disadvantaged communities and the nexus there. So if you're interested in that, we'll have a handful of really fascinating presenters who are experts in their field. And uh, I'll pop the website into the chat and you can register. Yeah, thanks, Lily. Um, we have one more question. I think this will be the final question uh, from Rosie. Was consultation covered by the contractor that did the permitting? Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's a group effort. <laughs> so the Water Forum and Bureau of Reclamation, we all do our work together to do our, I assume you, you mean Endangered Species Act consultation. So we, we consult through reclamation as a federal lead with Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, the, it's not a, it's a financial assistance agreement, not really a contract. Um, so Lily and her group, they, they, they have the people to do the work um, and work on the permitting. We all, we, it's, it's a big group effort. So <laughs> we all consulted basically. Yeah, we, it's one of the things I love about this project is we are, it's a really big cohesive functioning team. So everyone in the room really likes the project, really likes what we're doing, and we're all on the same page. We don't really have a lot of like, oh, I wish you did it this way, or there's no infighting here. It's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so for everyone on, um, Lily put a link to the Water Forum page for the upcoming symposium, so feel free to take a look at that. Um, yeah, and I think on that note, uh, I just wanted to thank everyone today for uh, taking the time to join us. We recorded this webinar and we'll, we will have it available on our CCAST YouTube channel, hopefully this afternoon. Um, and you can find that by searching for CCAST on YouTube as well as through our website. If you missed the previous webinars, we also have recordings of those. Um, those are posted on the YouTube channel as well as on the CCAST website. You're also invited to visit us on CCAST, um, where we have a case study from Lily and John that talked about some of the salmon restoration work that you heard about today. So um, Matt, I believe, put the link to our main CCAST website, as well as the um, shortened ArcGIS link that you can just go directly to the uh, work here in California. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for next week, next week's webinar as well. It'll be on Thursday, October 8th. Um, this presentation will also be in California, but a little further towards the mountains. Um, we're featuring some work for native Paiute cutthroat trout restoration in the Sierra, um, and it will also involve a non-native trout removal component. Please contact me or Matt if you would like to attend, um, but did not receive the webinar announcement that we sent out later today. Um, you can also contact us if you are interested in joining our Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. Uh, Matt would be the contact for that, and we can um, uh, add you to our listserv. So um, thank you again for your time, and I really want to thank John and Lily. Um, this was an awesome presentation, and uh, it's really nice for CCAST to be able to feature some work in California and also include a Pacific salmon component. So thank you again for sharing and also for contributing your case study, and uh, we hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.